Welcome to another session of the Catholic novel. Today we're going to discuss Walker Percy's novel, Lancelot. Uh, the novel is loosely uh, based on, not based on, but a kind of a tribute to Albert Camus' novel, The Fall. You may recall in The Fall, Jean Baptiste Clement spends every evening in a bar telling about a failure, a sin he has committed. And the sin is he was walking on a bridge, saw a young lady standing uh, on the bridge, as he continued to walk, heard her jump into the water and then stopped and then continued to walk and made no effort to save her at all. And this is his sin. This, this is the fall that he observed. And it's also the, her fall from the bridge, but also his fall as a human being. And so he goes on every night. He talks to anybody who will listen to him uh, to ha get them to face their own guilt and their own quote unquote sinfulness. Now, of course, the name John Baptiste, he's got a new gospel. And this is the new gospel. Now, in Lancelot, uh, Lancelot is in a prison asylum for murdering his wife and her lover. And uh, the entire novel, except for the last two pages, is Lancelot talking. Of course, he's talking to the reader. But in the novel, he's talking to a boyhood pal who has become a pre-psychiatrist. Uh, early in the novel, uh, something happens that uh, the reader is informed that the, the priest is having trump, some, trouble with his, some trouble with his faith. And uh, Lancelot apparently picks that up too. But anyway, he's telling why he's committed this murder and so on. Now he says, uh, I notice there's evil all around us, and yet nobody is ever accused of doing evil. Now let me, let me comment on that. I think the uh, Christian doctrine that is the easiest one to illustrate is original sin. If you wonder whether we're, we're born in sin and we're surrounded by sin, just pick up a newspaper or watch the daily news at night. We are surrounded by it, okay? And Lancelot is saying, you know, we're surrounded by this evil and yet no one is able to recognize evil. We excuse it in all sorts of ways. Uh, so instead of searching for something good, he says, I'm going to try to search for evil. So he's, he's kind of turned around the uh, King Arthur legend, you know, the Galahad was searching for the Holy Grail. He's looking for kind of the grail of evil, and he thinks he's found it in his wife's sin, sin with her lover. Uh, now, years ago, I loaned this book to a, fr a priest friend of mine, and he thought it was too preoccupied with sex. That was not, it was not my experience at all. It seems to me what Percy is doing in the novel is showing or hinting out the mystery of sexuality that can be so easily lost in the contemporary world. You know, the, the so-called sexual revolution uh, really gave out an enormous amount of misinformation and I, I personally think missed the mystery of sex. So at one point in the novel, Lancelot is speaking, you know, he's talking to this priest friend, boyhood pal, and he says, why was I so upset about adultery? If you, if you look at it biologically, it's not a very big deal. A small portion of the male body is inserted into the female body. Why should that upset me so much? So what he's indirectly suggesting here is there's something to genital love which goes way beyond uh, gen genital lovemaking, which goes way beyond the physical. Uh, I was reminded when I read this in uh, Lancelot of the, of, the, of the comment in the movie go of uh, Percy's first novel. Uh, Lancelot is his, is his uh, fourth novel. Uh, in, the, in the first novel, uh, Binks Bowling tries to have uh, sex with his with the girl who eventually would become his wife, and he says it failed completely because sex without sacrament can't possibly uh, bear the burden of the meaning and the mystery of what sex is all about. And I think that's why there is all this talk about sex in the, in the book. I don't, think, I don't think it's salacious at all. As a matter of fact, I don't think it's suggestive at all. And, and, if, you're, and if, you're, if you keep in mind, you're reading the thoughts of, of a person who is at least uh, occasionally insane. I mean, he, he committed this horrible murder. Now, um, the, um, the hero, the, the anti-hero of the novel, Lancelot, is about to be let, let out of the asylum. And he's got a plan. He's going to, through violence, uh, change society. He's going to restore traditional values, but he's going to do it through violence. And the last two pages are the only time anybody else besides Lancelot speaks in the novel. In the last two pages, the pre-psychiatrist says, I believe, 13 words. Before we, before we started the show, I, I counted again. One of the words is no, and uh, the other 12 words are yes, okay? 
So Lancelot says, you know what my plan is? You know what I'm going to do? Do you understand it? Yes. Uh, do you think it's a good idea? No. And then it goes on and on and on. And then at the very end, and this is not a, this is not a spoiler, at the very end, the last question is, do you, so, so he says, you don't, you don't think my idea is good? And the priest says, no, I don't. Well, do you have some other idea? Yes. And that's the end of the novel. Now, it's interesting. I have, uh, I have, I, I've had about 30 students at, Saint, at the University, St. John's University, read that novel. And nobody, in all the years I've done it, has commented on those last two pages. And I'm not you know, criticizing anybody. But I, I had no doubt when I read the book the very first time that what the preacher was going to do was, going to do was preach the gospel to Lancelot. This is the answer to all the problems in the world. Uh, but nobody, no student has ever mentioned that. And, and no student has ever attempted to explain yes, yes, no, yes, yes, yes. What, what's all that about? They just avoid it. Uh, and I think, I think that's a sign of how secular we've become. That what is, what is uh, I think, relatively obvious about what's going to happen, uh, the, the students just miss it. Now, to, to see the, signific the significance of this novel, and, and I, really, I really think this is important for almost every novel Percy has written. Percy, in his, in, uh, when he was a young doctor, he was, a he was uh, majoring in psychiatry, thought science was the answer to everything. I don't think he, uh, he, he, may, have, he may have even embraced scientism, the philosophy which says, you know, only statements of positive science are true. He may have believed that, but then when he got tuberculosis, he was shattered, okay? Uh, he, he thought science had nothing to say, nothing at all to say to a person who realizes he's going to die. And this was a, this was a terrific conversion for, uh, for Walker Percy. He re began to read all the existentialists, and uh, after he was cured, he and his, uh, the woman he loved became, well, both were converted to the church, to the Catholic church. I just want to comment on this. So can science tell us an enormous amount? Of course, but so can literature. So I, just, I, want, to, I want to read two statements that Percy make, makes. The first one is about uh, science, and the second is about novels and literature. Um, I mean, I don't think I have to justify this series on the Catholic novel. Um, I think the reaction I'm getting from some people uh, through mail and so on, everybody realizes that, 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 at least everybody who's been in touch with me, realizes the power of literature. But uh, I think there are people who think, well, it's, it's only fiction. Like, I know a friend of mine read voraciously. He wouldn't read fiction. He, he read history, but he wouldn't read fiction. Whereas, at least from one point of view, uh, fiction can be more powerful than history. History tells us what happened. Fiction tries to tell us why, why this happened, tries, tries to probe the human heart. Okay, so here's what, here's what Percy says about, said about science. If the first great intellectual discovery of my life was the beauty of the scientific method, Surely the second was the discovery of the singular predicament of man in the very world which has been transformed by this science. An extraordinary paradox became clear, that the more science progressed, and even as it benefited man, the less it said about what it is like to be a man living in the world. Every advance in science seemed to take us further from the concrete here and now in which we live. Did my eyes deceive me, or is there not a huge gap in the scientific view of the world, scientific in the root sense of knowing? If so, it was an oversight which everyone pretended not to notice, or maybe didn't want to notice. Okay, so the way he put it in, in other writings was, science tells us nothing about what a man who realizes he's going to die should do. Now here's the second one. Now this is about literature, okay? I've always held that art and even novels are just as valid as science, just as cognitive. In fact, I see my own writing as not really a great departure from my original career, science and medicine, because where science will bring you to a certain point and then no further, it can say nothing about what a man is or what he must do. And then the question is, how do you deal with man? And if you are an anthropologist in the larger sense, interested in man, how do you study him? And it seemed to me that the novel itself was a perfectly valid way to deal with man's behavior. And P uh, Percy did it in uh, six novels. And you know, obviously, if you've, if you've uh, heard any of my talks on the novels, you know I think he did it uh, marvelously. And what especially interests me is uh, 
that Percy is also a philosopher. The book I wrote on him, I call, I call him a, a prophetic existentialist Catholic storyteller. So without being preachy at all, Percy is able to integrate the existentialism of Kierkegaard and the existentialism of Gabriel Marcel. And he, 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 he blends them. For Kierkegaard, everybody is either living on a sense level, an ethical level without God, or a religious level. Everybody. You may have parts of all three, but you're predominantly on one. But for Kierkegaard, the primary religious category is the individual. If there is a, a strong sense of community in Kierkegaard, I miss it, okay? So sooner or later, you are alone before God. And you either choose God or you don't. For, per, for Marcel, you find God in other people. So Gabriel Marcel is very similar. He's, uh, Marcel was a Roman Catholic. Martin Buber was Jewish. But their philosophies are very similar. Both, both believe that when you love another human being, you are in touch with God. Uh, in every one of Percy's novels, in which the main character, who was always a man, achieves some kind of salvation, uh, not, not in everyone, in, in most of them, most of the six novels, finds it through a woman. Uh, Buber once wrote a, a, an essay criticizing Kierkegaard, saying he misunderstood religion. The other person didn't need to be an obstacle to God. The other person could have been the way to God. And that, <coughs> that is a vision I, I myself b believe in. I think God is everywhere. And when we open ourselves in love, in any way, the Holy Spirit can rush in, can use that moment to broaden us and deepen us and sanctify us. So um, take your pick, you know, of, of which one. I think, I think Lancelot is, is, is very, very different. Um, and I think if you, if you uh, take, t t take a look at it and read it, you'll find yourself completely engaged in, in several ways. One, what, what's going on here? What, what, is, what is Percy trying to tell us? And then, of course, in terms of the whole novel, most importantly, what is the Catholic priest going to tell Lancelot at the end of the novel? Uh, I, think you'll, I think you will like Lancelot very much. <laughs>